Okay, so uh, today we are going to uh, try to add some uh, interactivity uh, to our uh, example web page okay, that we developed last week. So basically the starting point would be, uh, what is that, uh, this web page here that I uploaded on, uh, on GitHub, which is, well, basically the same uh, that we developed last week, uh, more or less. It's just a bit uh, nicer to see because we applied a couple of more styles. Um, and as you remember last week, uh, uh, this page didn't do anything and still doesn't do anything. So if you click on the buttons, nothing happens, of course, okay? So we uh, want to, uh, but we already saw that we could, uh, you know, find some elements in the page and modify them by using JavaScript and the DOM of the page, okay? So uh, we know basically that, can, that we can read and modify the content of the page. We can add nodes, remove them, and so on, and modify their content. But uh, uh, we need to link uh, the, the manipulation of the page to some user actions. Hmm? For example, clicking on a button and so on. And uh, this is what uh, events are for. Uh, I, we already mentioned that uh, briefly, uh, that every time something happens, and happens uh, from the user size, side or for, from the network side. So something has been downloaded, it's been started, it's been stopped, downloaded, or the user clicked or typed something. So any time something happens around the page, the browser creates an event, you know, which is a special object, um, and the programmer can uh, handle this event uh, uh, by defining a so-called event listener, okay? So an event is just an object that is uh, uh, characterized basically by two main properties. One is the type of the event. So a click event, uh, an on-click event, uh, is different from a mouse button event, for example, which is different from a key down or a key press event. So there are many different types of events, uh, depending, of course, on, on the cause that generated them and uh, the so-called target of the event. And target is a <laughs> strange name for act the actual source of the event. So I mean that if I click on a button here, then the event is generated by the button. So I would call it the button is the source of the event, right? But uh, in the JavaScript terminology, that button would be called the event target, not source. So, it's a strange terminology, but we get used to it. The event target is the DOM element, so the HTML element, that caused the generation of the event itself, okay? So uh, uh, the event tender, my function, is able to determine why it was called, the type, and uh, from which element it was called, it was caused, it was generated, it was triggered, basically and that would be the target, okay? Um, for handling our own events, what we can do is to uh, add new event listeners, which are functions, which are JavaScript function, to uh, some specific events generated by some specific elements, okay? Uh, so for example, any uh, element in the page, any DOM element, any DOM node, can manage an event called, for example, mouse down, okay? Mouse down is not the same as click, because a click event is down and up, mouse down is only down. So you can detect when you're pressing down and then moving the mouse and then pulling it up again to do a drag operation like that, okay? But it's just an example. So imagine that you have uh, some link defined uh, uh, in your page, and you, with a given ID, you find the DOM element, the DOM node corresponding to that link, and you can attach an event listener to that element for handling this kind of event. So an event listener has three components, the event to which, it, sorry, the node to which it's atta attached, the type of event it will handle, and of course the handler itself, the function itself. The event handler is a function that receives an event object, 
that contains the type and the source, sorry, target, and a body, so something to do. Okay? Uh, many event handlers are attached to, to DOM nodes, so paragraphs, uh, images, uh, buttons, uh, whatever. Some events can also be, uh, you know, uh, applied at the browser level, so something global on the page. For example, the events for loading and unloading a page and so on uh, are defined on the window object and not on a node because basically these events uh, uh, happen even before, may happen even before any node is created. Okay? But, um, okay, the event object has these two properties and basically this page here lists uh, the type uh, of events that we can manage, so the different. Uh, Types. I try to zoom a bit this table. You know, there are some very uh, simple events like clicking and then double click, all the events are related to the mouse. By the way, you have a mouse move event. So every time I'm moving the mouse, even by one pixel, a new event is generated. So actually, there's uh, uh, a lot of them. Uh, uh, of course, uh, if you are dragging something from one place to another of the page, you are generating a mouse down event, many mouse move events, a mouse up event, and then finally the drag event that summarizes all of them. So these events are not mutually, mutually exclusive. They are all generated for every gesture that we are doing. And so it depends which one we want to handle. If we want to have a low level fine control over the mouse movements, okay, maybe we are drawing a shape then the mouse move is interesting. If you are just handling the movements of something, then the drag event would be enough. Okay, so it depends what you want to do. We, we have the control of uh, which events are important to us uh, to attach some behavior. There are keyboard events. Key pressing is the interesting one when you key uh, is pressed in general, and a key press is made of a key down followed by a key up event down and up, okay? Uh, and it makes a key press. Some uh, um, elements related to loading the content of the page, unloading the page, so before navigating away, something like that. Uh, events are related to forms, so where users change, when we are typing something to a form element, or we are changing a drop, uh, the selection in a drop-down menu, a change event is generated so that we can read the new value once it's changed. Or the submit event uh, that is triggered when you're clicking on the, on the submit uh, button for the form. So there are, uh, of course, the submit event on a button is the same as a click event on that specific button. But uh, submit is more, you know, semantically charged so we can Say, okay, this is not a normal button, it's the button for submitting the event, so we have maybe a special treatment for that rather than clicking somewhere else. So we have a, a long list of, uh, of um, possible events uh, that are basically increased every time a new type of interaction is made. You see that uh, the page goes on and on and on, but you know, we will focus on, on the main ones, okay? So we can control the behavior of our uh, web application from many different points of view. Um, when you register an event handler, let me go back, we have the method called add event listener. So add event listener means that add. <laughs> the verb add means that we may have more than one. Every uh, DOM node may have one or more even listeners to handle different aspects, and that they can be changed together. They will be called all called in sequence, okay? If we are more than one register to the same element. And in some cases, there are some even listeners that are already predefined by the browser. So for example, the submit button or a form, by default, submits the form. This is hardwired in the browser behavior. So actually, the, uh, the submit button already has one uh, predefined event handler. 
Normally, it, if we attach an event tender, we'll do something that we want, and then we'll go forward uh, with the default behavior. Okay? There, in these cases, and this is especially for the submit button, um, or for clicking on a link, if you click on a link, by default, the browser will lead you to, do, to, to a different page. Maybe you don't want to go to a different page, because going to a different page will unload your JavaScript and will, de will uh, you know, destroy your variable, variables. Hmm? Uh, so in those cases, you may want to um, tell the browser not to perform the default action. And this is done by calling the prevent default method on the event object. So you receive an event in your own event handler, you call prevent, prevent, prevent default, and this means that uh, uh, the default behavior will not be executed by the browser. It must be called every time, because you want to have to control for that, uh, and so that uh, you have full control over what happens. Uh, and uh, sometimes the default behavior is good, sometimes the default behavior can be you know, uh, uh, not so convenient for us. Especially when you are handing the submission, the submit button and the, the links, okay? And if we want uh, the browser to stay on this page, because this page contains my JavaScript, <laughs> I don't want the page to go away. So I must prevent uh, the browser to go uh, to other pages, to navigate away. So first of all, uh, everything is even driven, right? Uh, so, uh, if we want to do something on our page, we must uh, execute some code when the page is loaded. Hmm? So there are some special events that uh, uh, are fired by the browser when uh, the page is finished loading. So as soon as the page is loaded, and loading the page means loading the HTML and the other scripts uh, and uh, uh, you know, the um, uh, CSS styles and so on. Then the browser sends an event called uh, DOM content loaded. And this is an event for the node document. So if we want to do, to execute our code when the document is loaded, we can assign an event tender to our, uh, to the DOM content loaded event. And then our code will run. This is the normal way no, of uh, having, let's say, the, the main function in, in, uh, in a JavaScript application. We don't run the main function in a synchronous way. The main call will be run just after the page is being loaded. Uh, a detail is that uh, um, DOM content loaded. So all the content that comprises the DOM nodes. This means that some external resources, like images, for example, okay, may not have been loaded yet. I know we have a DOM node, maybe representing an image, so it's a no, an, an element node of type EMG, IMG. The node is already there. I know the source attribute, I know all the attributes of the node. But the image is still downloading, because maybe the page has many images and the browser can take time. So normally, we don't need to wait uh, for the image to display in order to be able to interact with the node of the DOM. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, uh, the content loaded event only uh, fires early when the node has been created before the image is being downloaded. So we can start maybe hiding it or uh, attaching event tenders to the, to the click of these images or something like that. And then in parallel, the image will, will arrive. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but the user can start interacting with the page before all the external resources are downloaded. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing. Uh, if we really want to wait until all resources are downloaded, we, you, you can attach your behavior to the load event of the window object. So it's window.load or document uh, DOM content loaded that are fired in two different times. Hmm. DOM content loading say, okay, you have the DOM data structure ready for you. And load says, okay, you have the DOM data structure ready for you and all the external resources will be downloaded if you want. Hmm. Um, so uh, the first step would be, let's go to our code, okay. Uh, 
we have an exercise to do, but just first let's familiarize with the, with the structure of the page. I prepared here the HTML of this page, uh, which basically is the same as last week. So this was the page here. Okay, and this is the corresponding HTML called answers.html. Uh, what you see here is that, uh, okay, I was downloading Bootstrap as a style sheet and uh, the icon fonts uh, and plus uh, we added some custom style sheet. Uh, this custom CSS is only used uh, for pushing this uh, footer to the bottom of the page, okay? Otherwise the footer would appear right after the, the end of the table. It will not be a real, real footer, okay? But it's just one instruction to push it down, to, to put an absolute position into the, to this, uh, to, to this, TV, to this uh, paragraph, basically. And, uh, and then we have the JavaScript corresponding, uh, okay, for the helper JavaScript for Bootstrap. We already had that last week. It was a position at the bottom of the body, now we moved it up uh, with a different attribute, we, but we learned that. And uh, uh, I'm also loading some libraries. For example, I expect to, to, that I will need DJS probably. And so I can download them directly on the web page. Uh, I, so I'm downloading different libraries that my application would rely on in order, all with the different attributes, so that they will be downloaded in parallel and executed serially in the, in the correct order. Okay, okay. so that's a, they're just all libraries. They don't do anything. Then we can start uh, writing our own application. Sorry, I deleted some. Uh, writing our own application. So let's import another script in our page. Script defer, so that it be download, uh, executed after everything has been downloaded. Source equal to, no, app.js. Okay, so in this case, we are also loading a file called app.js, downloading and executing this file. So let's create it and see what we can, we can do there. So in this folder, I'm creating a new file, app.js, in the same folder. Sorry, the word exists, why? Oh, sorry, it's... Uh, I already prepared this, uh, it was not uh, empty, uh, to have this, uh, the, I just copied and pasted the constructor function for our answer and, uh, and, um, and question objects. Hmm? But they, it doesn't do anything right, okay? Only the function definitions. Yes? Yes, yes, the defer, uh, executed, the, um, performed the downloading of all the scripts in parallel and then the execution in order after the DOM has been prepared and in the right order. So, yes, that's guaranteed. Hmm? So the order in which it appears is important and, is, and the execution order is deterministic. It's not, uh, the difference is with async that will execute them in any order as soon as they're ready. Hmm? Okay, so, uh, Apart from this function definition that actually don't do anything, we want to add some behavior to our page, okay? So uh, what the event uh, says is that we can attach some behavior to the loading of the page. Hmm? So this means that we can write document dot add event listener to the event DOM content loaded. Oh, okay, there's a good suggestion here. And we provide an event listener like this. So the second parameter to add event listener is uh, the handler function. This function receives uh, one argument, which is the event object. And uh, right now, the code that you're writing here will be executed right after the page has been loaded. If you want to see it, let's try to write a console.log. 
page loaded. And uh, we can go to the browser, reload the page, and see what happens. So we go to the browser, we open the console to see the results here, and if I reload this page, I see, of course, page loaded there. Okay, when I'm executing this code here, page loaded, I'm sure that all the DOM nodes corresponding to this page are already been created. So if I want, I could, uh, for example, in the HTML, uh, I had this table which had an ID, for example, okay? So inside that code, I could uh, maybe find this uh, table and uh, uh, with the DOM uh, content manipulation method that we saw last week. Uh, for example, we can find the table, const table. I find it by querying the document, um, by querying the um, get element by ID with the ID called answers-table. For example, and uh, just to just to see that we are trying, we are able to access the element. Okay, const dot uh, so const dot log table. And so if I, you see, I printed here the table element. So inside our JavaScript code, we were able to find one element in the page. And if we want, we can modify it. So if you want uh, maybe just a, a, a magic trick, so we may make it disappear. I don't know. A table dot um, visible or hidden, sorry, like we did last time equal to true, it will set the hidden attribute on the table and it disappears in this case, okay? So uh, at least, the, sorry, the attribute was on the table body, not the table itself. So that's why the header is still there and the body is hidden. But just a, an example to say that once we are there, we can find the node that we want with the query you know, methods and modify them as we want with the attribute by changing the attributes of the element. Okay? So that's what uh, we can do. It's not what we want to do. <laughs> what we want to do is to, uh, let's follow the text, creating the list of answers in a dynamic way. So right now, the list of answers was manually typed in the HTML code. Uh, what we want to do is to learn how to dynamically create this list and dynamically you know, uh, manage this list. For the moment, we are, uh, all our universe is just this web page, okay? So there's no external database. We are doing everything here. And this means that we can manage the list of uh, answers or the list of questions also as a uh, local data structures, variables huh, in our JavaScript code. So imagine we have a, a list of answers as a list of JavaScript objects, and we want to generate the table, the full layout of the table, starting from this data. Okay? Um, so imagine that uh, the list of answers is in a JavaScript array, and we want to display it in the table. The JavaScript, the answer object is already defined. We already had it here. Okay. Sorry. Um, and we want to create the table with the three associated buttons. Basically, we want to create dynamically what here is uh, typed in statically. So actually, we want to start from an empty table and recreate 
you know, with our code, all these rows, these three rows in this case. Okay? So this has been, uh, has to be created at the beginning. So imagine that uh, in our code, okay, here we, we were just playing here. Let's remove this. Uh, our table is useful for us. We keep it there. And what we need to do is to create load whatever the uh, list of answers. And then uh, generate the page, the table content, starting from the list. Okay. Uh, this is only a, a partial generation of the table because you see that here, sorry, let me, okay. Uh, let me save this so that here we have this part of the table that depends on the answers. But we are also have this part of the page on the top that depends on the question. So also this part should be dynamically generated starting from a question object. Okay, let's, let's do one, one of the two for the moment, okay? So basically the page is no longer a final page, it becomes a template that needs to be filled with specific information. Uh, first of all, we can create a data structure here. So for the moment, uh, we just uh, input this data structure here in the code. Later, we will learn how to load this data structure from the, the API. We already have an API for giving me the details of a question and the list of answers to the question. So, in general, we would re read the data that is needed to fill this page, to complete this page, from a remote API. Right now, let's fake it, okay? Let's say uh, that we can create a, a question from a get question API and uh, the list of answers from a get answers for that question. I don't know, I'm just faking it, okay? Imagine you uh, You have some functions that will call the backend and then populate some internal data. Okay, okay, we don't we don't have those. We can create them. For the moment, we'll just write functions that you know create some static data, static information. So um, we can define them here. Uh, for example, function get question, and uh, we may return, create and return a new question object. So return new question, and we already know the parameters. The ID can be one. The text, uh, let's copy this from the page. The text of the question was uh, was was. This one, in quotes, of course. Then we have the email of the author. We can copy it from here. Then the date. Is the date displayed in the page? No, it's not displayed here but we may, uh, let's remember, or oh, the data needs a string because it will create the JS object itself. So today, 2024, 4.16, and uh, that's it. 
ID, text, email, date. Okay. We are done. You see that I'm calling a function that is written down, okay? There's no problem. I, the question if a function, or here I'm calling get, get question, question of line eight, and get question is defined in line 14. This is not a problem for function defined with the function keyword, okay? Because there's this mechanism is called, um, I don't remember the name, that pulls all the definition of the functions at the top with function and var hoisting, that's the word. Functions and bars are hoisted at the top of the file. So you can put the definition wherever you want, but it like it appear at the beginning. So that gives us freedom to, uh, to define the function in the order that we want, so that we have more important functions at, at the top. Only if we are using the function definition. If you are defining the function with an arrow or with a function expression, of course, uh, we need to execute the statement for defining the name. There's no hoisting on those. No. So that, that's why I'm using functions so that they can declare them in the order I want and call them from wh wherever I want in the file. And so um, what can we do? Oh, the answer, or the, the question is an add answer method already. We copy it from the previous times. Uh, so uh, maybe I can, I can change the, sorry, not, uh, would be something like uh, fill answers or load answers from the question. Because it doesn't return the answer. It just fills the new answer to the object. So imagine another function, load answers that receive a question, and uh, we'll just do a set of uh, add, add answer method calls. So it will be for us question dot add answer, new answer, and then we put uh, the information about the first of our answers. Would be an ID, oh, sorry, one maybe, the text of, of the first answer. Let's copy it from the page. The text of the answer is yes. Then we have the email of the first responder, this one. Then the date was 24 to 15. 2024-02-15. Finally, the score that is a minus 10. And then we add it again, question dot add answer. New answer. To the text. This one, uh, then we have uh, email, let's start with two, okay? The date, 2024, 3, 1, 20, 24, 3, 0, 1, and then a score that is uh, Okay, so in the reality, this would come from an API call. For now, we are just faking the result of the API call. Let's just imagine that uh, those API just return some data and this data is being used to build this object. From this code here, it looks like we are loading information from somewhere else. The mainly dif main difference is that uh, this, def this object definition is a synchronous call. If we call an API, it would be an asynchronous call because we need to, that's what would make, it would make it more complex. So, for, but for the moment, we'll say, just ignore that. And then the interesting part is uh, generating the table content starting from the list. So just to be sure that we actually defined 
and uh, we don't have any so dot log any errors in our code. Let's see what we created here. So let's reload it. And this is the console.log of the question object that, of course, uh, contains uh, the array of answers that contain two elements that they look like right. Hmm? OK. That was the faking part. Now for the generating part. So we can imagine that this part of the HTML, so all the table body, will be generated dynamically. So let's make me just open a new file and copy and paste this part to that file. I don't want to lose it. But I remove it so that I have here. <laughs> but I remove it from the page. So right now, the HTML only con uh, contains uh, a table with a heading row And uh, so here, the heading row and the last line here, I would also put that uh, probably in a table footer because it's easier to see. It's easier for me to separate also this row in a table footer. OK, I'm restructuring a bit the HTML. And what I have a ta is a table with the first row and last row, which are constant, and uh, a table body, which is empty. And my job will be to fill this body. Hmm? So if I save this file and uh, go to the browser, I will see an empty table, of course. So the second part here would be to generate the table. And uh, we already know that the table is here. The node pointing to the T body element uh, that needs to be filled with different rows. Uh, so, for example, what we could do is to uh, iterate over the answers, and for every answer, we generate a row and we append this row into the table body. Hmm? Easier to say than to do. Uh, so we uh, iterate over the answers. So for answer of question dot answers. We take the answers one by one. Okay, I can use the four, or you could do the for each, uh, you know, uh, uh, so um, functional statement, but it's the same. We are taking one by one, and for each of them, for each answer, we need to create one new row and to append it to the table. And how to create a row? We need to create DOM nodes to correspond to the row itself. So how is a row composed? We have the example here. Table row is a node. That has a one, two, three, four, five children, which are table data nodes. And these table data contain text. OK, so it will take us some time. But for every answer, we must first create a row. Const table row from document. Create element of type um, TR and then we need to append this element to the table body. Okay, so it's TR uh, so the table dot uh, append child, uh, so let's, we have a nice slide here. Okay. 
with some methods uh, for, like for example, append child from a parent element, which is the TR in our, in the T body in our case, uh, we add a new ch child, uh, which will be the row. So I can do append child of this TR node. Okay, we are adding a new empty row. Let's see it in the browser. Uh, sorry, I, I forgot the const here. Always remember to have the console in the browser open, okay? Because the page will never show you any error, okay? Uh, the, a, the browser will try to go forward even if you have some error, so, but of course it will not work. So the console is very important uh, and uh, try to correct all, all the errors you find because if you have many errors that you forgive, okay, it's not a problem, it's just a warning and then you have a, lot of, a long list of errors and you risk to lose uh, no, the, the real one. So. Okay, so if I run this, nothing happens. Oh, nothing seems to happen. But if I try to inspect the HTML, probably I would see. Uh, sorry, where is that? Uh, the empty rows in the T body. I have two empty rows. It's no longer an empty body. It's a, it's a body with two empty rows. Hmm? Well, it's a small step forward. Now we need to fill the rows with the columns, with the cells. Hmm? So we have one, uh, the first cell, the first column would be for the, what was that? The date. Okay, so the same game have, applies. We can create a, a const td for the date as a new uh, document dot create element of type td and we append this uh, td dot date to the to the row tr this time we are appending to a child to the row And in this case, we have uh, one empty cell. We need to set the text of, so TD date uh, in our text. It's a property of, the, of a node that could be the date. And the date is uh, from the answer dot date dot Format. This is a DJS object, so we need to format it to a string in the, I don't know, year, day, month format. So, that work? Yeah, something is working. And we repeat this for the second column, for the third one, for the fourth one, and so on. By the way, what I did here is to create a row and append it immediately to the table. And then create a cell, uh, um, yeah, a cell, and append it to the row, and then set the uh, attributes or the content of this cell. Uh, we can, you can do this operation in any order you want. Now, for example, you could prepare the row, add all the content of the row, and then append it to the table just at the end. So that in these lines here, I'm you know, preparing a row in an invisible place, let's say. Because it, it's an object, of course, describing a row, but it's not yet appended to the DOM. Uh, 
it's really it's irrelevant for the, because JavaScript always runs to completion of the current function. So the browser will not try to modify the page until you finish the function. So the important thing is uh, that you have everything set up when you are closing the, uh, the closing brace down here. The, uh, the browser is not uh, modifying the visual aspect of the table at every instruction that you write. Okay? It would be very inefficient uh, to refresh, repaint the page every time you modify something with it. So it's really up to you whether to prepare the objects and then to add them or to add them at the beginning and then populate them with, the, with details. It's just uh, different ways of writing the code, but uh, the final effect is the same. When you, f you exit from this function, the browser will repaint the page with the, the new content, DOM content that you are added, okay? So I appear at the beginning so that I can forget uh, <laughs> about that, huh? and then I populate that. So these three instructions are repeated for all the other cells. So you have a second cell that is about not the date, but the um, question. So it's already the answer, sorry, the text. So, so the second one would be a text. And uh, the difference is that uh, it's not answer dot date, but answer dot text. And if I reload this, uh, I would have also the second column up here. And then the third one for the author, the same trick over and over again. What did I do here? And then it's answer dot author. Oh, sorry, maybe it's called in a different way, the field. Email, sorry, email. I reload, okay, and score, const, td score, it's the same. Uh, is a TD score here? TD score in a text uh, answer dot uh, uh, score. And we have a final column TD actions. And we append it to the row. And now inside the action, we still have to put the button, okay? Yes? Yeah, yes. What, so what she's saying is that uh, this for, uh, say, snippets of code are the same. Uh, we could use a for in to iterate over the properties of the object. Uh, yes, uh, but we lose control over the order in which the attributes are, are presented. So it depends on whether they come in the right order. Yeah, yeah, we can do it. You can, you can try to, to automate that if you want, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, or having, uh, maybe still better, uh, an array with the names of the, of the attribute that you want, and then you iterate over the, this array, and so say, pick this attribute. So that will also give you the option of uh, having only, or displaying only some columns. Uh, maybe the objects are more attributes and you, want to, you don't want to see them. So you could have a more general function, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very simple, because we are creating just one cell and one text for every uh, element. Uh, also, we are using inner text, which is a shortcut. Uh, because inner text already creates a text node and then appends it uh, to the node, to the container. Because normally we should, you know, for if you want to create a node by ourselves, uh, we should create a node uh, 
like create, create text node. Because the, the table with the text inside is actually two nodes. One is a TD node, and the other is a text node, which are linked. Uh, and so we should create a text node and append it, and then the, the text will be the property of the text node, the value of the text node. Inner text is a shortcut that will create the text node for us and already populate it. Okay? And uh, well, shortcuts are welcome, of course. And the same goes, maybe we can use a shortcut also for the last column. In the last column, we have to, to write this for creating the buttons. So that would mean adding a button element, setting some class attributes. There is an add class method for doing that. So add class button, add class button warning. And then an I element with some classes as a child. We can do that just to try, okay? So for this, uh, and then we sh we'll see a shortcut. Uh, so these TD actions, so we need to create uh, the uh, button, button, the first one was, uh, sorry, was the, the um, up, no? Bot. Is a dot create element of type button. Then we need uh, to add some classes, button bot, uh, add the class. Uh, Class, uh, class, sorry, class list dot uh, add. Class list is an attribute with the list of the classes currently assigned to the object, uh, and the add method adds, uh, um, adds all arguments passed except those already presented or present, of course. So you meet the button and uh, button. Uh, what was that uh, warning? And then we add this button vote to the cell to the actions dot uh, add pen child to uh, over button vote. So let's see what we got up to, up to now. Well, this one. It's a button with no content yet. We may add some content uh, by creating add, uh, the other node, const uh, um, icon bot, document, uh, create element, i, icon bot, class list, add, is, uh, These two. And then we need to add the icon to the button. So uh, it was the button vote, append child, icon vote. We did it. It's like putting together small piece by small piece. The shortcut, yes, we have a shortcut which is uh, inner HTML. What we could do is to use the inner HTML property, for example, to these uh, TD actions. So all the cell that uh, express a, a string that will be parsed as HTML and the browser will create all the nodes for us. 
So if I take this uh, and do cut and paste of these three lines, I put them here. I use the, uh, the backtick syntax, uh, okay, so that they can have a new line inside the string. It's more readable for me. And I forget about all of this painful way. It will create all the buttons for me. So actually, inner HTML will take the string, understand the HTML, and create all the nodes and subnodes and attributes and classes. Of course, converting them to DOM nodes. So we have also always the possibility of saying, okay, I will create the nodes myself, or I will create a string, an HTML fragment, and let the browser create the nodes. Hmm? So, uh, of course, we could have done also the, the full row in this way. Here at the beginning, I could have just written here tr, dot append, sorry, uh, inner HTML equal to the full row. The full row cont is, uh, contains some arguments, some parameters, but uh, as template strings, we can manage those. Okay, so for example, let's take the first one, the, the whole row here. to here, for example, and uh, we could write this here, okay, this is not the, the date, I should take the date from the answer object, so I could do that with the answer dot date, and here would be an answer dot uh, text. That will be an answer dot email. And finally the score. So this should work in place of all this code. I'm leaving I left I leaving the button out because it's already done. So let's check it. Yes, okay, I, I didn't specify the format, so it went with, by the default, but it's another way. So either we create the nodes and assign the attribute, the classes, and the content, or we create a string. Uh, the common way is, uh, is, uh, is to use a template string because it's convenient, because it can break into multiple lines, uh, and you can use the interpolation syntax to inject values inside your strings. Both ways are good. Okay? So this solves our first problem, the first uh, requirement of our exercise. It was uh, create this table. And the second point is uh, try to uh, implement the function for voting an answer. So this means uh, and, uh, adding an event handler to the button well, that we create. And this event handler would uh, modify, well, the answer object itself plus uh, we would uh, modify the content of the page. So, um, first of all, we must add an event listener to the, bot up, uh, to the button, okay? So, how can we do that? Well, okay, with the add, leave, add event listener method to the button itself. We have two buttons in this page. And so we will have two event listener, one per each button. These two would be identical, of course. Same function, but 
separate inst two instances of the same function, I would say. Okay? Um, in my main function here, generated table content starting from this list, uh, this is what we did here. We have two options. One is to register the event handler when we create the, the table. So if we are creating the table with the first painful way, let's forget about this for a moment. It's easy because uh, we have the button vote object. We created it. So it would be easy for us to add a button vote uh, at the event listener. Even click. Do something. Right? In the other case, it's a bit a slightly more complicated uh, because in the second case, we don't have a, a variable that is already pointing to that button node. So after we create the, the inner HTML, we need to query it uh, to extract uh, the reference to that object in order to be able to add the event listener. And uh, we have three buttons, uh, so we need to select the button with uh, the warning uh, attribute, for example. Okay, so we need to play with the query selectors in order to extract the right element, and then add the, the event listener to that. Uh, maybe we see it later. Let's start with this. For right now, I have only one button. Okay, I, I commented this part. We only have one button, which is the click event. So let's see what happens. Up. And maybe we also print event.target. So we understand which button is clicked, because we have two of them. So let's reload the page and pull up the console. So if I click here, it's telling me, okay, up, and I the so the click event has been generated, has been handled by my my function handler has been called, and the event dot target is now the I element because I clicked on the icon itself. Uh, well, did I register the event tender on the icon? No, I registered it on, on the button. In fact, if I click on the corner here, I see that the event target is the button. What happens is that uh, when I register an event tender on, a, on an area of the page, even the elements inside of that area will inherit that behavior. So the target would be the most specific element uh, that generated that event. If I use the normal old style button with the text inside, uh, I wouldn't see the difference. Right now we are using the bootstrap icons and actually we have two elements, one inside the other. And so the target actually gives me the, the detail. And uh, of course, if I click the second button, it behaves in the same way, but it's a different uh, object. Right now we don't see the difference between the two because they are identical in this way. So we have two problems here. One is uh, I have two different tar event targets which is a, something I don't like and the other is how to decide whether we need to increase this score or this other score. Okay, so the first uh, problem is solved by using another property, which is more, uh, in this case, more useful. It's called the current target, like the documentation says. 
the current target identifies the element to which the event tender has been attached. So we have a slight difference. One element triggered the event, which is the icon inside, but the event tender was attached to the outside button. So that even the target is the element that was actually clicked. Even uh, um, dot uh, current target is the button, the container element uh, for which we added the listener. So maybe in our case, it's more useful. If we need to say, okay, this is the button, whatever it contains, uh, <laughs> this is it. I don't need to, uh, to see the difference between the, the internal location where you clicked. Hmm? Uh, and in the other case, maybe you have an area and you want to add a big uh, event tender to an area, but then you need to know inside this area where the user clicked. And so the event of target would be more useful. In our case, uh, to get rid of the ambiguity, we can just use current target instead of target. And if you reload the page, we see the if we click on the arrow itself, it will give me the button. And if I click on the corner, it will always be the button. Because the event tender is attached to the button. And current target gives me the handler object. Hmm? So that's the first problem. We can make uh, you know, uh, clickable areas as complex as you want uh, and always be you know, specific about uh, which one was the source of the of the event. <clears throat> the next problem is, uh, okay, I have uh, this callback here. I'm writing that as a narrow function here. I could also have a function written somewhere else. Uh, it doesn't matter. And I need to increase some score. Which score? The first or the second? I don't have the reference to the answer object anymore, right? The only argument of this event is uh, the event, sorry, or to the, event, to the handler is the event itself. An event only has two properties, target and, and type, which is, of course, click. The type is click, we don't care. So we have probably three ways to give to this callback the information about which answer has to be changed. First, we can play on the attributes of the button. For example, we can create this element and add an attribute, so uh, which is the button <coughs> vote. Dot ID. We can set an ID of maybe the ID should be unique. Okay, so let's call it the answer dash uh, answer.id, maybe. So these buttons will not be identical anymore. They will have different IDs. They're not just one, two, three, because I cannot have many IDs. Uh, maybe I have other list in the page, and I must create these IDs in a specific way. So this is one possibility. If I click here, I have a button, answer one, button one, and so on. If I click there, it will be answer two. So in my event tender, I just need to extract the ID, event.currentTarget.id, parse the number, and find the right answer. Right? Or, we can add an extra, a personal, a custom attribute to the button. This is a JavaScript object, right? 
So who, tell, who told us that the, the properties of JavaScript object are fixed? Okay, answer ID equal to answer dot ID. And so here I should be able, I should be able to access the console.log, sorry, event dot current target dot answer ID. Let's see if it works, if JavaScript is my friend. Okay, I added an attribute to, a, to a node, but it's just a JavaScript object. The browser should let me do that. Yeah, one, two. So I'm hiding in the target some information. By the, by the way, it's already an integer. I don't need to parse from a string. It's an, an object. So I'm storing some data into the browser page. It's mine. Another trick to do the same thing is to use closures. Remember, we are defining a function which lies in the lexical context in which answer is a defined object. So inside this event tender, I could use answer. Okay, so I could store the answer equal to answer. Is defined here, up there, in the four. So I can create a closure to this variable from this event handler. And then, see, the answer dot ID if you want. So this one was uh, storing in DOM node. I get this one. And the other was just uh, remembering through closure. And they should show probably the same information. Storing the node, the answer is one. Remember to close is one, and the same is there, two and two. So the event tender is the same function, but is bound through closure to different objects, to different answer objects, or to different DOM nodes. You can choose. <laughs> also, the DOM node is uh, no. In this case, it's not a closure because you get it through uh, through the current target. But you can have. You know, many instances of the same function that are closing with the closure on different variables. And so you can have inside this function all the information that you need. And so let's do something useful. Doing something useful is uh, what? Is uh, changing the score. So right now, I think that, OK, of all the possibilities, I think you agree that the cleanest one is the last one. Okay. We, do, we don't need to mangle with the IDs or to store some attributes that inside some data structure, which is in, inside the browser. We just have the variable. Just, just remember how closures work. Hmm? And also because we can store, OK, we have the, the full object. The full data structure. We don't need to store that into a string or to a number. Okay. Um, and so in this case, we could also increase the score. So the answer dot the score increased by one. Hmm? Which is a pretty useless operation because if I click here. Of course, the answer object will increase the score, but the score displayed in the table doesn't change. There's no reason for it to change. I need to change it explicitly. 
So I need to update the data structure to reflect what I'm doing and also the view, the presentation to reflect the data structure. That's an extra step. The extra step is uh, finding this cell that contains the number. How can I find the cell? What I have here is the button, even dot current target. The button is contained into a, so I'm here. Okay, I'm the button. I need to find the five here. So I could navigate the graph. From the button, I could go up to my parent, the TD, and left to my sibling, the other TD, and change the text inside. Or I could go up twice, from the button to the TD, and from the TD to the row, and then from the row, find the fourth column, so the fourth child of the row. It's the same. We need to know the structure of the page to navigate locally. So probably the easiest one is going up and left. So the, the score, so the TD that contains the score, is uh, the current target, parent, is called parent node or not? I don't remember, sorry. Yeah, parent node is an attribute, not a function, okay. Dot uh, uh, previous sibling. And they can try saying that this score, so if I'm lucky, the score points to the table data besides me. And they can change its inner text. Inner text. Sorry, dot inner text. Uh, with the new score. So I run it again. Yep. It's very fragile. We can understand it's very fragile because if you just reach in the columns, everything breaks. Or if you are adding some, some extra column or, okay. Or if you want to put a border around the button so that uh, the button will not be a direct child of TD, but a child of a child, it will break and so on, okay? So in this case, it would be better maybe to go up and to, to have some uh, ID some predictable ID on the different table data here. I would probably put a span over the numbers with an ID corresponding to the, to the question number. So that it, I don't need to navigate blindly and locally, because here we are navigating blind, right? We, sorry, we assume that if I'm here, I'm blind, I go up, I go left, I will find what I want. If I, need, if I want to be more robust, it would be better to say, okay, let's mark the nodes that I need in a specific way, with an ID or with a class attribute, and then use uh, the DOM finding methods like uh, DOM query selector, document.query selector, to find exactly that node, wherever it may be in the page. So if we also shift and change the layout, the node that contains the score will always have an ID of score dash number of the question, of the answer, sorry. It's our strategy. We need to identify which elements in the page trigger actions, so where to attach event tenders. And once we are there, we need to find where is the information that we need to operate and what, where are the other elements that need to be affected by this change. The goal of this exercise is to understand how much it's a mess. Okay? 
to work in this way. It's complex. Right now, we, by the way, we, also, we just modify one local data structure. In general, when we increase the score, what we would need to do really is to make a call to the API, say increase the score, and wait for the result with an increased value because maybe some, somebody else has increased in parallel, so we cannot rely on the plus one, uh, and then regenerate the page, the, a part of the page. So that would be much more complex we could, because we cannot do that everything here synchronously in one just block of code. There would be asynchronous calls, uh, so we must wait for the promise to do the next step. So it will be at least three times deep, three levels nested in promises. Hmm? But right now we are already two levels nested because we have a, um, a, all of this, all our program, just remember, is the body of an event listener, okay? That inside, when the ex we are executing the first event listener, we are scheduling other event listeners. And nobody prevents us from doing that more. So actually, it's uh, Programming this way requires a, a very clean way of thinking, a very clean structure of the database, oh, sorry, the, the, uh, the page, or the HTML page. We were able to write this in one hour only because we already had the HTML written. And it was written in a clean way, and we already ex knew exactly what to generate and where to put things. So we are starting from a, blue, uh, from a blue, blueprint of a static page and we are making it, let's say, dynamic. First we generate the content, and then we generate the overlying interactivity. And interactivity is always finding an element, finding the action that this element supports, a click, define the event tender, and the event tender inside will get the information, where am I, what are the current values, updating the information, and updating the page. And updating the page means finding the nodes to be updated. Just imagine if you had, uh, I don't know, a field down there with the average score. If you had the average score, every time you click on up here or there, you need to recompute that, recompute the average, and then update the page wherever it may be. And if the average appears here and also on a bar up there, because maybe it's, you show it in a graphical way, green or red, you also need to update that. And if you have a vote down, we, in the vote down you must do the same. And if you have a delete of the row, again, every time you delete, you do something different with the, with the data structure, and then we need to update different parts of the page accordingly. So that uh, requires a lot of discipline okay, on our side. And that is why one of the reasons why uh, people moved from basic JavaScript to frameworks that we will see starting from next week uh, on um, we get familiar with, with React. That gives us a way of you know, ordering these, these operations. We will not control anymore the DOM. We saw what it means. It means working at a low level, creating nodes, setting node attributes, and then every behavior we are on, on our own because we are programming at a very low level, okay? If you have a complex page with, you know, filters, uh, or uh, for the different, uh, or so resort in the table. Hmm. We must be organized. If, for example, if I want to add some sort operation, sort in the table according to a different column, which is a basic operation. Every table, we, you can click on the column name and have the table sorted by that. Okay, we need to add even listener to each column, and then implement the sorting, which is the easy part, and then maybe this means that we will choose to create a function, an extra function, just for regenerating the table from scratch. It's easier. 
every time you change something, okay, let's recreate the table value, which is fine if you have three rows, which is less fine if you have 50 rows, because then performance would suffer. So we didn't, didn't, think about, didn't talk about the performance here. Inner HTML is nice, but it requires parsing. Again, and again, it slows down. It's not just the same as modifying an attribute of the DOM. Modifying an attribute is, no, takes no time. Parsing HTML requires some more time and may also have some parsing error. So, so it's a complex game here, okay? And there are a lot of details to, to take into account. Uh, this will be always the basis. And all the JavaScript frameworks will try to ease us from some of this burden. Say, okay, I will do something. For example, React is doing all the updating for us. We just see, okay, we want to create this, and everything a data updates, uh, the page is updated for us, and regenerated only the parts that are needed for us. So there's a big part that we don't need to care about. But for the framework to help us, we need to follow the rules of the framework. So we will not be free anymore to organize the page or the code as we want. We, both, we need to create uh, functions or components in a way that the framework can use them. We need to store data in a place where the framework knows where to find, and so on. Okay, so it's a trade-off between productivity and you know, simplicity of use. Uh, versus freedom or no, versatility. We'll find the, okay, you <laughs> will, uh, you'll see, you'll see, or we will see together, okay, when we start uh, uh, React. For the moment, just re remember if you want, uh, it, we, we will have one lab uh, working on this level, just to be familiar with what it means really to work with the DOM, okay? And then the framework will hide the DOM from us. So next week, we know that the DOM is there. We know that everything comes down to some operation on the DOM nodes, but will be handled by library. OK. Um, I think uh, the exercise calls for another function, deleting an answer, which means adding an event listener to the delete button, and that would uh, just find and delete the row. Okay. Well, the item in the table of answers, the data structure, and also the row on the so you can um, you can just you know, modify what you already did with the update vote is very very similar. All the functions are very similar. It's not a problem of implementing a single function. It, when everything in the page is, is the same, uh, also modify the same, it's, uh, you know, it takes a lot of repetition and coordination. Uh, what I want to do in the next hour is not to complete this uh, um, exercise, but to go back a bit because there were some questions about uh, the API and the asynchronous behavior in the APIs. Uh, and so I would probably go back uh, to that part uh, and see async await structures and uh, see some the pause, how, how we can handle that. So I knew that there were several uh, questions in the labs, uh, so we have time to tackle that. Okay? So have a nice break <laughs> and see you in uh, 15 minutes. <laughs>